you have a new album coming out called The Traveler. Yes, so I wanted, ask, I wanted to ask you about that. What's the story behind behind that? I, th I read somewhere like it, it kind of culminates the first two, the story, is oh, that? Concept-wise. Yeah, concept-wise. Um, yes, it, it's, uh, there's a connection to my first two albums, uh, solo albums, uh, New World and Static. Um, <clears throat> so in a way it's like a trilogy, but uh, it's funny because um, uh, in Continuum, my band, my other band uh, has two albums. That's what's a part one and part two. And the part three is sort of like a trilogy, but in a way it's like uh, probably not gonna end there. So it's just gonna keep going. And I think the next solo album might have a connection to it as well. So it's really just like an ongoing thing that's, that, and they're actually both connected. The Traveler connects in continuum story to this. But the thing is, you know, there's always a, a like double or multiple meanings to the songs anyway. So they're all in some ways related to something that means something to me personally. So they're not always like just pure fiction and pure science fiction or something. They have some real down to earth relatable topics that either uh, relate to something I've, I've personally experienced or friends have or I've seen or something moved me and made me want to write about it. So in a way, it's all connected that way. But it's also, there is actually like the traveler character is in acceleration theory on in continuum. And because he travels with his mind and he's able to speak to people telepathically. So he's kind of everywhere in a way. Okay, cool. So there they could be standalone stories individually. And standalone songs too, a lot of times, um, especially this album. Um, in on the past two solo albums, a lot of the songs just kind of like weave into each other. And this one, I made a conscious effort to do things differently. Uh, first of all, my debut solo album, New World has two versions there's a, uh, a single cd version and a two cd version and the two cd version is chock full both cds so it's like over two hours of music um the traveler i have i had so many people asking for vinyl that i um challenged myself to be able to make a concept album work um on one lp so it's a 45 minute album roughly and it's not easy to do but i thought of albums like duke or dark side of the moon you know and i thought okay if they can do it i can do it but you know you just can't have the 20 minute epics you can't do all that stuff right. um but uh and and it came out really well so but it's even more so uh a collection of songs that could be standalone as well as works as a concept so yeah that's right yeah the duke album they were able to they still had those long like the duke suite at the end but it was still right. a 45 minute thing yeah so i saw on the the pre-order page you have this edition like the super duper deluxe with the with the art print from um obinsky i was curious how you connected with him um my mom is in the art business <laughs> okay. and um, she has a company called Patne, and she used to have a gallery in, in New Orleans and, and, uh, and in New York, but uh, she's retired now, but they still sell the art and do different things. So she used to be uh, Rafal's agent. <clears throat> so he pulled a favor because he's a world renowned artist and you know i've had great artists like ed unitsky did the cover art for uh for static and he's he's done a lot of albums you know rock albums obinsky does more like uh new york opera posters and um 
Earth Day posters and and Time magazine covers and things like that, like heavy duty. You know, his his work is in museums, and his works sell for a lot of money. So the interesting to people who collect it, and I have some of his uh, paintings as well. Well, I don't have the originals. The originals are very expensive, um, but you know, like a print, uh, a graphic, and um, I had. Um, 50 graphics made of the album cover and I, and I have the original I do have his original he, he custom painted it uh, to my his version of what I was envisioning with the doors and the sky and, and these things and I, and I kind of knew his style so I said things that would be in his um, <clears throat> wheelhouse and so he custom painted it and I got the painting it's just a little bit bigger than the and the prints but the prints actually fit inside a 12 inch box so when the vinyl comes out if, if i still have any of the prints um we've sold you know there's only 50 of so i think we sold like 10 of, of them or something i mean it's not cheap but the irony is that if you for those for people who collect opinskis it's i think it sells for like 350 bucks uh or 500 bucks I, I forget somewhere in that vicinity but the print the prints sell for that anyway on their own signed by him and these are signed and numbered only 50 mm -hmm. so you know if, if if people who collect his paintings uh and prints if the word got out to them they they could just buy it and throw away the music you know? <laughs> <laughs> or they could listen to the music for a change and, and it's a soundtrack to the art yeah yeah, because gone, gone is the way of people sitting down with liner notes and, you know, the sleeves and reading along. And No, no, not really. I mean, it depends. In the niche genre of Prague, that's what everybody wants. Um, and if anything, it's, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and expense. Uh, that artists have to go to but fortunately there is that niche market for it mm -hmm. yeah. so, so did you grow up in a musical family no no not at all no I'm the only one I'm the black sheep <laughs> so what drew, you, what drew you to the piano well we had a upright piano and everyone took lessons not everyone but by my parents and I took lessons uh, my brother doesn't play, but he actually runs a music software company called IK Multimedia uh, as a business businessman. But uh, but when we grew up, um, everyone took piano lessons from this guy, Mr. Stewart, and he was really strict and kind of boring. And so I, I, one day I said to my mom, I said, do you mind if I quit? And <laughs> I was thinking about quitting, too. And so we all quit. And then the p piano was in this like converted garage playroom thing that we had and i would just bang on it and create my own you know noise masterpieces uh you know to me and i was like you know getting on into it and my mom said to me she's like you know you see you're the only one in the family who seems to be really into it do you want to take lessons from this other guy i met or whatever this guy brad and he was awesome you know, he was so cool, hip, and he would teach me like Genesis and, you know, learn stuff by ear and, and then explain it to me. I mean, it, it was the best way to learn because it wasn't like shoving theory and all these things down your throat. He would do that, but he would make it fun. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's yeah I, did, I did teach her like that growing up with piano and he was a huge progressive rock guy. And that's cool. um my parents were Genesis fans when I was when I was very young and they had the We Can't Dance album and I was just when I was little I was just obsessed watching the thing spin around and I you know and then I took it to him one day and he's like I'm a huge Genesis fan and he did the same thing he had perfect pitch so he would write the songs out and he goes okay I can do this but we have to split the lesson in half and, and learn theory cuz you yeah, know same way. that's you a great way parents <laughs> yeah cool yeah cool so then so you started collecting vintage keyboards then, right? So was that because of your love of that style uh, of music? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, my heroes were Tony Banks of Genesis, uh, Keith Emerson, Rick Wakeman, Jeff Downs, 
and they all had all these keyboards, you know, or Herbie Hancock. I mean, I, I read this magazine called Keyboard Magazine, and it was mm -hmm. just the best magazine. Yeah. And I grew up in the 70s, so I'm old. So there was no weekend dance when I was a kid. It was more <laughs> of, well, it was Duke, actually. It was the first Genesis album I listened to. And I grew up in the 80s, really, actually. And so I was a teenager in the 80s. And um, I would read Keeper Magazine. The thing is, is they were so expensive back then. Um, and they've gotten expensive now again. <clears throat> but there was a period, like in the 90s, <clears throat> where people were getting rid of them cheap. And I lived in LA. So every week I would pick up this magazine called The Recycler, which is like an eBay or a Craigslist in a magazine, a bargain trader. And I would go, oh, there's a mini mode for 200 bucks. I'll buy one of those. I remember one of those. You know, and like there was a PPG that I remember that was like 10 grand originally or something. And it was 500 bucks because someone thought it was outdated or whatever. And I never thought that. So before they were even called vintage, I collected them and I sampled them. I recorded the sound of them. If I, you know, would sell them, let's say, because I needed the space or just had a little revolving door. It was sort of like a hobby. Uh, although I'd sell them for, for more. So it was more than a hobby. It would pay the rent. <laughs> um, and But I would sample it because I'm like, oh, I'm getting rid of this PPG, but, you know, I'll, I'll record the sound of it. And I had so many samples, I created a company called Sonic Reality, uh, where we sell the um, samples, still do, uh, for software samplers for musicians to use. And actually, I, I, I um, you know, to earn a living back then, my 20s, <clears throat> I licensed the sounds to Roland, Alesis, they had these vintage cards uh, that they put in their synths and... Uh, program sounds for Yamaha and you know that's how I kind of you know make make ends meet and uh you know like I said I I, I work with uh I'm a partner with IK Multimedia and we create software that musicians of every style use and uh it's kind of my day job it's a fun day job though yeah so when you were doing the programming then did you have to learn code coding no, no. Patch yeah. programming. Oh, okay. So just, you know, and the irony is that I grew up and I wasn't that much of a tweaker. But when I moved to LA, I moved to LA in 89. And I found that I could get gigs programming synths and running samplers and doing the things that, let's say, producers and songwriters were too lazy to do. They didn't want to do it. Like, let's just hire somebody to run that. So, um, <clears throat> So I would do, so I would just show up with, sometimes with the gear. So was, I'd show up with a mini mug and I'd program it for the session. You know, sometimes play it, but sometimes it'd be like Greg Filling Aids or some great player. And I would just be there to kind of, you know, um, get the sounds and stuff. So wow. it's wild. So you don't, you don't think that's going on, you know, in the, in the background. You know, how does how does somebody have one keyboard on stage and they have all those sounds? Oh, well, yeah, that too. Uh, I've, I've never really been that into that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I, ironically, Tony Banks of Genesis uses my sounds and I bought all of his keyboards. That's that's the, the bookend to that story <laughs> is I uh, grew up sort of reading Keyboard Magazine and watching. Uh, actually, I probably became a keyboard player because of watching Turn It On Again, the video where he's playing all these keyboards, I'm like, that looks cool. I, I, you know, you looked to me like you could play any sound. And ironically, you really couldn't, but that was like the whole way the keyboards were advertised back then. It was like, it's a synthesizer. You can synthesize any sound of your, it only limits your imagination. And uh, it's not really true, but, uh, but with sampling, it is. So I sampled all of them. And now Tony Banks uses my sounds and software, amongst others. Uh, but And it's just ironic because now he, he can do any sound of the orchestra or any, any guitar sound or anything he wants. And, I, and, and it's from me. And I thought he could do it with those vintage keyboards. And then I bought his old vintage keyboards. Um, and uh, now. So it's... Uh, but the... And the irony is that he does, he, so I have all his profits and 
our all, all this stuff that's like you know old still sounds great um but his the last genesis tour the v last last genesis tour he had just a few controllers and everything running on a computer on main stage with uh, sample tank and hammond and other plugins from ik miroslav um Although right there, Tony's not the type of person to have it running somewhere else and someone else doing it. But there are bands that have like one keyboard and someone else in the back is doing it. I've never been that guy, though. I'm not a sequence or, or tracks. Some people run tracks. There's like a Wizard of Oz under the stage running actual recorded tracks like The Wall. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the guy who does that because I've worked with him, Mike McKnight. He's the Wizard of Oz. So there's different types of techie gigs in, in the industry. Mine was more, in fact, I met him because he was working with Madonna. And I, and I met them through the recycler, actually, because I was buying or selling. I was selling something, and they were buying it for their tour. And I was just talking to them, and they're like, yeah, we're the techs, MIDI, MIDI techs for Madonna. So oh, really, I said, and they're like, what, what do you guys have? And he said, well, we just got these Akai samplers s3000 and they were the first to get up and, they, and she, of course because she had money she got six of them yeah I'm like, oh, what are you gonna do and it's, i don't know i'm like oh you should use one for just a piano no one had ever done that before <laughs> you know 32 meg piano and they're like oh that's a great idea and i said i have it i could do it and so that's that's how i ended up getting that gig and it turned into other gigs but that's where i met mike mcknight and so i was doing sound design kind of his thing and he was doing you know all that stuff that he does with Mariah Carey and Madonna uh, and, and Roger Waters for many years. Um, cool. So, so that so then you also do just one more question about the, the programming because it, it fascinates me. But you know, I've seen you do the drumming also, like um, sampling drum drum sounds. So I'm curious when you do that, is it difficult to separate from separate from it where you want to tweak it? That where your your sound, you know, your own personal sound, you're comfortable with, but you have to separate yourself from what the artists. Well, if we're sampling, um, <clears throat> like we sampled Neil Peart, we sampled Terry Bozio, Billy Cobham, um, it's all about their sound, uh, but to an extent, um, it's their kit. It's my. I usually, uh, you know, do it with the original engineer. So we got. Uh, we did a whole slew of them called Epic Drums with Ken Scott, the original producer engineer, recorded the Beatles, Elton John, Super Tramp. So we had Super Tramp's drummer, Bob Siebenberg, with, with Ken Scott on the original console. I mean, trying to recreate the masters. You know, it's a lot of work for a very esoteric uh, talk about. It's, it's in a similar way, actually. It's kind of like Prague, where it's a lot of work producing these elaborate albums for a niche small ish audience same thing with those samples you know if i made a hip-hop library it would sell 20 times as much but you know i looked at it kind of like look this is i'm very lucky to have these opportunities and look you know uh um you know peart's gone now and so it was a little window of time where you could capture his sound we did that with nick Raskulinix, who produced the last couple of rush records and uh it was an amazing experience personally getting to meet him and work with him and and nick and a learning you know experience but also to capture that sound and let people have also his grooves that's obviously just him and then the, but the kit is a combination of the way he would hit the kit and then also the way anyone would hit the kit because you have different positions of the drum so he might not hit the edge but you could hit the edge. So in that sense, it's not tailored per se to my taste, it, it, maybe a little bit, uh, just because I'm a keyboard dr drummer. I, I'm a frustrated drummer, so I like to play keyboards for the drums. So like I do things a certain way that I like, uh, but it's with people in mind that would want to go, oh, I actually want to do something kind of light and he it's harder or i want to do something sort of uh, groovier with ghost notes and and rolls and stuff like that so i have all those mapped across the keyboard in a very elaborate way um <clears throat> and 
Yeah. So basically, the and th and this was the whole idea of it. This is what they all wanted. Neil wanted. All the drummers wanted is this idea of look. You could do Rush covers with it. You could do covers of the drummers bands, or you could do your own songs. And most of them were actually excited about people being able to do their own songs with a little element of, and that, that's why I actually created a, a, a label and a project called Sonic Elements out of Sonic Reality, where I actually use those uh, sounds to create either tribute albums or original songs with, with different people and stuff, just having fun with it. And you hear this element of like, okay, you know, you're actually playing with Neil and it's something that, you know, he wasn't a session drummer, so he wasn't going to do it. Or uh, Nick Mason from Pink Floyd, I recorded with Alan Parsons, who hadn't recorded him since Dark Side of the Moon. We have samples of that. And it's like, you know, a chance to have that element in your music when you buy it. It's really cool. It's just, it's not immensely popular. It's just one of those things that when you, you know about it. And I actually got the idea from another company that was doing it. They recorded Steve Gadd and Bill Bruford, you know, and I was like, oh, this is, you know, this is cool. I can play with those guys virtually, you know, and have fun. And, you know, <clears throat> so then we did it. That's cool. So your first, your first solo album, New World, you used that, the sonic elements, right? First, when you were writing the music before you gave it to live players, is that yeah, a Sonic Reality. Um, Sonic yeah, reality. the elements from Sonic Reality. Um, yeah, like uh, sometimes, um, and most of the time, I would program drums and get it to a certain point and then play it for the drummer. The drummers on that record are Nick DiVirgilio and Simon Phillips on one of the tracks. And Simon was, I sent the track to Simon. Actually, I just finally met him in person on Cruise to the Edge. We played on okay. this yep. show called Cruise to the Edge. And we played him the track. Fernando Perdomo, the guitar player who works with me since then uh, on everything, um, was like, do you remember playing on this track, Crossing of Fates? It's like, no, I don't know. And so we played it for him. And, oh, yeah. Oh, it's complicated. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he did an amazing job but the funny thing is that it was like I, I i didn't even ask him i should ask him but i don't think he remember uh, i don't think he even listened to my my mock-up track he was probably like oh yeah okay i'll just do my thing i'm just <laughs> myself, so get out of the way but uh but in a very you know like just because of what he did like i couldn't physically do i don't very few would think of what he he's just a very innovative drummer but a lot of times i, I work with marco miniman who's another great drummer uh and actually he's on my new solo album but he's usually on the in continuum albums and so nick di virgilio and marco miniman are on the new album and a similar kind of thing where i would just do a guide track and i wouldn't go nuts i can go nuts i like to it's fun but i would just kind of go something like this and then they embellish it because they're the drummer you know mm -hmm. and that's the general thing like i i'm a songwriter so i have guitars i write on guitars but i let the professionals do it i'm a professional keyboard player probably and and now singer you know i wasn't always even a lead singer since New World was the debut of me being the lead singer. I sang backup for years, but uh, finally went in the front spot after the frustrations of sound of contact and other things. I was like, all right, this is, I'm just going to do it. Because I didn't want to do it, actually, at first. I, I thought of myself more as like Tony Banks, you know, where it's like, I'm behind all these keyboards. I'll write the songs or create them. Let someone else go out front and, you know, get the audience to go, okay, you know, everybody over there. You know, <laughs> I'm not that type of person. But um, but I've embraced it and, and I enjoy it. But yeah, so I write, I write for everybody, but I let them have their voice and do their thing and embellish their parts. Yeah. So when you first, um, when you played your first solo gig, I'll call it, you know, tour, touring New World, was it, was it scary being up front the first time? Strangely, no. Hmm. But I have this crazy crazy story of but it's really kind of meaningful to me it is it was it's a weird one so 
over the years, I've been very fortunate through either sonic reality or with music or all these things to be, I've been around in circles where you're like six degrees away from Kevin Bacon and mm -hmm. six degrees away from some of your favorite artists. So um, one of my favorite artists uh, is Francis Dunnery from the band It Bites. And uh, <clears throat> he's on New World. And it, it, there's a whole story with him, but, you know, we became friends and, and um, he invited me to a charity event that he does every year in Northern England, um, in Cumbria. And uh, I went one time and uh, we played with Steve Hackett. In fact, I brought Steve Hackett in to play with him and he was a huge fan. And then in 2014, I think it was, um, when New World was released and we were going to play on Cruise to the Edge. And I had a Kickstarter campaign. We were going to do a couple shows before Cruise to the Edge that people were invited to. Um, during the rehearsal time we were supposed to rehearse, I was invited to the charity event again for that year. It's an annual thing to play with Robert Plant. Led Zeppelin songs with Robert Plant. <laughs> and I love Led Zeppelin. And I had to turn it down because it was either that or rehearse with my own band for my very first show. And I'm like, I have to choose... Yeah. I can't like wing it, you know, so I had to turn down Robert Plant to do my own show. And I, and I, but I thought to myself, this is a milestone moment, not because of like, I mean, the fish that got away, that part is sort of just a funny kind of like, man, can you believe I turned down Robert Plant to do my own show? And like people are like, what? Why would you do that? It's like, well, actually, I mean, I would, would have loved to have done it, but I, it was, you know, I chose me and I'm like, I could have done this my whole life. And I, I always was like the side man or, or the behind the scenes or doing things for other people to make music and all this, all these things. And I thought, finally, I reached this plateau where this is what I'm doing. I don't need to get a gig. I'm not trying to audition for something. It's like, this is my gig. And this is the most important thing. And I thought, that's amazing. That's like a wonderful feeling of like there's nothing i'd rather do than perform my own music and be the front man and it ever since then it's always been that way i don't get nervous uh about being the front man um the only thing i <clears throat> i might get nervous about is remembering the lyrics because i I'm, i i played in a band with a, an artist named kevin gilbert in the 90s and he's no longer with us but he had a band called Toy Matinee. He wrote for Sheryl Crow. He wrote for a lot of artists and worked with a lot of artists. And he was, I looked up to him and he was a brilliant lyricist. And he kind of set the bar high for me for like wordy, intelligent, clever, you know, writing. And uh, so I do that. And, but then, you know, remembering all the lyrics, they're not that simple is a challenge so if, if i'm nervous at all it's kind of like okay i just don't want to i've got a million things to do i've got buttons to press i've got keyboard left and right hand i've got feet that's why i'm called squids that's my nickname mm -hmm. my hands and feet everywhere and i gotta sing and i gotta remember the lyrics to my own songs at least you know i think to myself when we're rehearsing like dude these are your songs like you know at least you know and you're the boss so it's not like anyone's gonna fire you if you forget it but uh it's it, that's a challenge and and uh you know we don't run any tracks any backing tracks or sequences at all fernando's a purist so he won't he won't let me he'd be he'd, he'd walk out he'd be you know so we we're all live every single time um but yeah no i'm excited i love it that's cool yeah you mentioned you mentioned kevin gilbert and I, i've seen the dvd when you guys were together for the thud the thud release oh yeah and, yeah and that's like the first time i've seen you perform um on video and then i discovered you actually through your cover of keep it dark that you did with simon collins right because you you ended up playing keys on that album you you catastrophe yeah that's not on that album that was oh, okay the precursor to that album uh but it's actually the precursor to sound of contact as well um, I did play a little bit of keys on uh, You Catastrophe, um, especially the song I co-wrote with them called The Big Bang, which has Phil Collins. One of the last songs that Phil, it is the last song that Phil did any progressive rock type drumming on in the studio. 
Um, but uh, Keep It Dark, we did. I met, I was working with Genesis in 2006 for the 2007 tour. Um, and that's where I met Simon. Well, they invited me to rehearsals and I met Simon at rehearsals and then we kind of hit it off and decided to do a cover. Uh, and he he wanted to do it actually in honor of his dad and and and, and the band and just all, never did one. It was always, and he's like, you'd be the guy to do it with. So we co-produced it and, and I actually played keyboard drums on that one, but using Sonic Reality Sounds. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, because you co-wrote it, and when he, when Phil walks in the studio, do you tell him to play these certain drum parts, or do you well, just... Well, uh, that song was, that was done remotely. Um, I, I, um, I didn't meet Phil until, uh, oh no, I had met Phil, but um, I wasn't there in the studio with him. In fact, I've worked on several records with Phil on it, and I wasn't there. In the, in the 90s, I played with an artist named El Shankar, who played with uh, violin with Peter Gabriel. And uh, I did this record. It's not that great, but uh, I played keyboards on, on his record, and Phil's on it, and Bono and the Edge. And I didn't see any of them in the studio. I'm like, dude, <laughs> like, yeah, you know. But uh, with Simon, they did, I think they did that record in Las Vegas, and I was in um uh florida yeah and um and, and but it was it, it was a uh a nightmare because i had to drive to the studio like late at night because they needed my trash for the mix and i had already sent them and it was i i remember that being very 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 hectic uh just to make sure i'm like this has to be on the album like this my tracks what i did like mellotrons and all these things it was like so uh yeah but now um, I've never worked with Phil in the studio, like physically, uh, but, you know, I've worked with a lot of famous drummers and um, musicians. And you just uh, you one thing you can't do is you can't act weird like a fanboy and get all kind of, you know, you need to just be normal, chill and just like you would be talking to any other musician and, and they appreciate it musicians appreciate it like once you're in the studio it doesn't matter that it's a legend or someone famous or any of that stuff it all, it's all just like okay i mean different people take direction you got to read the, as a producer you have to kind of read people and you, you have to understand psychology you know if if uh but one of the interesting things was uh they have to like you and trust you so like neil peart you know, he's intimidating. He was intimidating. Uh, but Nick is probably around my age, in his 50s, Nick, Nick Raskulinix. And he's like a big kid like me. And, and he loves all the old Rush records. So watching him produce Neil, uh, he'd be like air drumming. You know, no, no, you're going to do it like you used to do. All right, all right. And he'd push him lightly because he trusts you and and otherwise you know it's hard to direct someone like neil he's so smart and he knows what he wants and stuff but um you know i, I remember when i did the session with nick mason and alan parsons two legends and i was totally chill like as if it was like another day with fernando or whoever in the studio and there was this one moment where nick was in the in the live room and he goes is that all right dave and then alan turns to me and say like, yeah is that all right and i'm like i can't believe this is <laughs> like in my head i'm thinking like pinch me here this is yeah. crazy and i'm like uh yeah yeah that's good yeah do it. <laughs> try it again try it again and i'm like i'm the producer here you know it was granted it was like for a sample session but it was a dream scenario you know which I mean, no one else has had that experience because the last time they worked together was Dark Side of the Moon. So, um, so did you end up asking Alan about recording that album? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you find your moments and you know ways to talk to people. I interviewed them. There's you can actually Google it or put it in YouTube. There's a little bit of that interview where I just talked to them on, and you can see the interview it's where I asked them. But then, you know behind the scenes i'm still asking questions here and there but you know you got to be also not too annoying 
and, and read that like, you know, Alan's very, was very cool, very, you could ask him like, how much did you make when you, when you worked on that? He'd tell you, you know, he, he's very chill. Uh, and, and actually Nick was too, really nice guy. Um, they'd tell you, you know, almost anything. Um, but, you know, if you felt like you were, at, but, you know, I mean, even Ken Scott, I would, I mean, it was hilarious actually being friends with him and having him on speed dial or whatever. So, you know, if you're talking to someone you're like having a nerdy argument about which mic the Beatles use and like, well, hold on, I'll call him myself. Hey, uh, Ken, what, what did you, uh, what did you, what did John Lennon use on the, on the white album on this song? Whatever. Oh, he used the Neumann KM56. <laughs> and you're like, oh, there you go. <laughs> and actually, a lot of them love to tell the, those kind of stories as opposed to like the gossipy stories, although he has a whole book and there's a lot of funny gossipy stories about Ringo and all these different things that they did in the studio, the shenanigans. But, uh, but from a, I'm all, I've always been interested in production and recording and engineering and everything. So to be talking to Alan Parsons and saying, what did you use on the drums for Dark Side of the Moon? And he would be like, oh, we used these gates called Keypacks and we did this. And so I bought all those things you know, so that I could get those kind of sounds. And we're doing a Pink Floyd tribute. And we've got Nick Mason's actual drums as the element, you know, just having fun. That's what I like. Just to, to wrap this up, I, have, I actually have a gear question for you. So yeah. I see that you use the Nord keyboards. Yeah, I see you do too. Yeah, so I actually, I just bought this. This is the Piano 5, the, the new one. Cool. And I'm, I'm new to the whole... Nord world. I've been using a, a Korg M50 for like the last 10 years. And it's just like when you when you update to this thing, it's crazy. But I'm I'm curious when you're using when you're using the Nords on stage, are you using sounds you've created? I did actually get my Nords as payment for creating sounds for them. Oh so I, okay. I created sounds for the Nord sample library. Uh, for Clavia, but um, yeah, I use my own sounds. I mean, not exclusively. I like their piano and their, you know, electric pianos. So they're just great. So the meat and potatoes and the organ and everything is fine. But it has a sample section. I use the Nord Stage and the Nord Wave. And uh, I have an opportunity to put in custom samples that I've done. So that's one of the reasons why I like it because um you can turn it off turn it on again uh, no pun intended and you can uh it just has your sounds and flash ram or rom mm -hmm. uh and you know in the old days i used to have a kurzweil uh k2000 and had 64 megs of ram and a floppy disk and a little hard drive inside and i remember one time playing with kevin gilbert actually the power went out for a second and I came back on and the band was ready to play and I had to load up 64 <laughs> megs. I missed like a whole song because, you know, uh, of loading it. So with the Nord, you don't have to do that. It takes like a minute to boot up, but yeah. So I, I love them. And the other thing I love about them is that uh, not so much the one you have, a little bit the one you have, but the stage, especially in the Electro, which I also have, um, and, and the wave have just like immediate buttons and knobs like the old days, but with the modern um, abilities to stack layer and, and uh, put effects on things. And, uh, but you could, I, I'm a very um, active keyboard player, more like a guitar player would be with sounds changing. So I don't just, I don't pray, not only do I not play presets per se i'm always programming my own sounds but um they're changing they're alive you know like so i'll, I'll have pedals assigned to do things and I'll, I'll i'll go tweak knobs or i'll tap a delay or i'll do things live with it uh, because it's in front of you and the keyboards even though i've, I've created sounds for the a lot of the workstation keyboards the digital ones that have menus and everything i like the motif and just different I like them, but I don't really like them as much live. Uh, you can actually, if you're clever, 
that I should be clever if I do this kind of stuff, but I sort of shy away from it. Pre-program and assign certain like generic knobs and things to do things. But I'm actually more spontaneous, like a guitar player would be, and I respond to the music in the moment. And so to do that, you don't have time to flip through menus. You need to just all lay it out in front of you and go, up, 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 and I'm there. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like doing a gritty Hammond. Okay, there we go. You know what I mean? Um, or I want to put a distortion on the synthesizer lead. You know, seconds I'm doing that on the Nord. That's why I like it. Cool. Cool. Um, so I'm going to end with three rapid fire questions. All right. Okay, so if you could be the keyboard player in any band in history, who would it be? Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. Why? Well, you're not going to be the keyboard player for Genesis. That's never going to happen. Right. <laughs> uh, and you could be the Pink Floyd keyboard player. That's a, that's a gig. So. Uh, you know, but uh, I mean, really, the I was the original answer in my head was for me. Like I said earlier, I, I enjoy doing my own music, and there's something beautiful about. In fact, I just love new music. I love Pink Floyd, but there's really nothing new that's great like the old days, you know, or at all. But you know, like I don't. I bought the last record, but I, I don't really love it. It's not classics like the other ones but the previous ones but uh you know so doing your own music it's up to you to like what quality you go for with the lyrics uh or the production everything i'm into all of it so yeah me cool but you know for fun i mean the beatles i mean i could list all my favorite bands i'd love to play keyboards with you know but um i mean yes and i and i even have a little a side their side band the guys the younger guys from yes billy uh, jay uh, john um and jimmy han have a we have a band called arc of life and so that's my little yes playground when we go live we'll do some yes some different songs um but that's where i get to pretend like you know that that experience um is is close but uh but like i said you know i'm not uh as much in, I'm not into it for name dropping, even though I can name drop till the end of time. And I'm not into it for the novelty of like, hey, I, I did this. I'm the keyboard player for so and so. It's like, I'm here. My purpose is to contribute art, music I like, to give more of it out there to the world. So it's like the music I liked. And now I put it together my own way and I put it out there to keep that going as opposed to let's say playing in a tribute band which some of my friends do and that's a fun gig but it's like yeah but you know and i, I taught them like don't you want to make your own music and like, oh no there's enough time this and i'm like all right somebody's got to just do it you make less money you actually make more money in a successful pink wood tribute band but uh but you have a priceless reward uh for doing your own music if you're proud of it and I, and I am so, you know. Very cool. So if you had to, by the way, rapid yeah. fire questions, not so rapid answers. It's okay. <laughs> Semi rapid. <laughs> not even close. Yeah. So if if you had to, if you had to choose one album for the rest of your life to listen to, and you couldn't listen to any other one, what would it be? Oh, I don't know. The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, maybe because it's longer and it's full of really good stuff yeah i wouldn't want to choose one album to listen to that's you know like choosing one thing to eat yeah once but uh, if i had to sure <laughs> when you when you played you played the the lamb at prague fest i have a question is that where you met kevin doing that gig no no he actually called me out of the blue he got my number because he heard that I had Mellotrons and I had a whole keyboard collection in LA. And uh, and I'm like, oh, I know who you are. Uh, and so I knew Toy Matinee and I said, yeah, come on over. And then he saw all the keyboards that I had from Tony Banks and he's like, oh, we should get a bunch of guys together and do the lamp. 
but that was we and I'm like sure let's do it you know and then that went quiet I thought he was kidding I don't know you know and then he asked me to join his band Thud and he asked me he said do you want to come audition for the band I said um sure he said actually it's not really an audition you're the only keyboard player I know so you pretty much got to have the gig you want to just show up and, and be in my band and I'm like sure uh so I was in his band and and we had a drummer named Toss Panos who's great played with Steve Vai and all, all sorts of people and um and then he said to me one day he's like still want to do the lamb and I said sure he said I know the perfect place uh the problem is it's um it's in two weeks <laughs> two weeks to get the band together and learn the lamb like, all right let's do it and he said i know the perfect drummer and it was nick de virgilio and then nick ended up becoming the drummer replacing toss <clears throat> and thud and so that's how that whole thing happened okay yeah i never understood how that connection happened very cool yeah just out of the blue i mean a good friend of mine mark mccright turned me on to I, I have these friends i love i love them just as people but like they're also really cool because they're like walking musical encyclopedias fernando's like that randy mcstein is like that and mark mccright was like that back then and so they would just you know turn you on to stuff like hey, have you heard this have you heard this have you, have you heard kevin gilbert have you heard draft you know like they had the whole collection and everything bootlegs you know everything and so he turned me on to Kevin. Um, so I was very familiar. And then of course he was blown away because he was a huge Kevin Gilbert fan. And he's also a Crowded House fan and I worked with Neil Finn and Crowded House. So I would invite him backstage and like to the shows and he was like, ah. but I'd have to be like, dude, you, you know, you have to be very chill. Like you can't be like, I brought, <coughs> I introduced one artist that I was producing back then to Neil Finn and and he acted like a complete idiot he was like we're not worthy we're not and Neil was like who is this guy I'm like I'm sorry you know he's like you just so but anyway it, it was fun being able to I mean, Mark wasn't like that he was cool in fact the only bootlegs of Kevin back then were probably recorded by Mark with permission you know with his dad you know uh hat with the microphones or whatever his rig was yeah. <laughs> cool well dave i thank you for doing this sure kyle no problem and best of luck with the new album i pre-ordered it i'm excited about it and oh cool thanks man yeah i would have given it to you no yeah. no no no, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right man i appreciate it all right take care all right take care